dystopian times. I wanted to go to um, also Tina here, not just because uh, I wanted to see more of her dog who's on the screen. I know. But uh, <laughs> you're you're um, you're you're around the country and you're kind of seeing the way that the police behaves. And, and, and to me, like, I feel like most people who've been paying attention, they should have viewed the last couple of years as a full on mask off moment by police forces. Yeah. And to give you an example of that, I mean, Portland's bizarre experiment with not policing Proud Boys rampage ends in gunfire. This is from uh, Robert Mackey of The Intercept. And there's a lot of videos yeah. of people outraged that they kind of just let the Proud Boys get away with everything. This, uh, You know, a similar story in uh, Los Angeles, which you were a part of, Tina, that I was hoping that you could speak to as well, um, where there were Proud Boys, the LA Police Department essentially stood by, which is what the criticism is. And that led to uh, this viral moment, which a lot of people have seen. This is you right here. Uh, this Capitol writer, Tony Moon, is attacking reporter Tina Desiree Berg today and ripping her mask off today in downtown LA. Um, so can you talk a little bit about this, Tina? Uh, the way that events unfold because of the police, either their presence or lack thereof. Like, what have you seen in your experience as a journalist who's on the ground? So, you know, what happened uh, two Saturdays ago, ago and also in Portland, uh, actually Sean Beckner Car Mitchell, who is the who is the reporter that actually filmed the guy with the gun. I know him personally. I've worked with him. Um, you know, he was hiding behind a car as this was happening. And I saw the video. I was like, Sean, are you kidding me? And he's like, yeah, the guy had come forward. Um, he had chased them. He had produced, pulled the gun out, ran back. So this had been something that was a build up to that too. But here's the thing. Everything we're seeing right now, all of the unrest, all of the violence, we've, we didn't get here overnight. This has been building up for months now. And I could say without equivocation that the police department treats both sides differently. And that is part and parcel to the problem. If what happened on Saturday or if what had happened in Portland, if those had been BLM activists, mm. they would have been shot. There's yeah. no, I, I can yeah. say that without equivocation. So I have hours and hours and hours of footage where I've been at a skirmish line and I've seen the difference in the way the LAPD treats both sides. And oftentimes they're only facing BLM activists. They don't turn around and look at the Trump people. Um, on, you know, and on Saturday, you saw that that was right in front of LAPD headquarters for people saying, why did it take the, the cops so long to show up? I'm like, they were there. They were there <laughs> before it started. They, I mean, wow. they were standing right there watching it. And, um, and I'm pretty angry right now because, uh, and I'm going to name names and shame names I've decided because I'm kind of done with this whole thing. Um, Sergeant Gordon Helper, who is part of that Rampart division and Captain Stabile, they are both part and parcel to the problems. They're both giant Trump supporters. They have been openly um, supporting Trump and saying ridiculous things about Antifa on their social media for months now. But the final straw for me was that Tony Moon actually um, went online and made this empathetic post about Tony Moon. Uh, Gordon Helper did. So I'm like, wait a second. So you were there on Saturday when I was being assaulted, when two people were stabbed. Also, there were two stabbings. When another woman was hit on the head with a hydro flask and had blood just gushing out of her head. Mm. You were there. You did nothing to interfere. And the old, and when you finally did interfere, it was because one of the anti-vaxxer guys, one of the Trump guys, was stabbed. Then all of a sudden mm. you're going to get involved, right? Meanwhile, somebody else on the left had also been stabbed. So, I mean, this violence should have not have happened in the first place. But I think they, you know, they allow it to happen. They have a bias. They're bringing their bias to the skirmish line. Um, and it just blows my mind. So now this is escalating. Um, I don't think this is getting very much media attention. But Tony Moon has now been showing up at the homes of journalists here in Los Angeles. Um, he, he showed up at, there's a gentleman that I know that works for Vice, who was a senior editor there. Actually, he's not there anymore, but they showed up at his house this week. Wow. They showed up, yeah, showed up at his house, him, Tony Moon, and like a, a, a group of five or six people. And they put flyers all over the neighborhood calling him a terrorist. Um, then they showed up at a photojournalist's house, who I know her name is Emily, um, and did the same thing. And so he's actively trying to find the addresses. And I'm sure he's going to show up at my house at some point. Why wouldn't I be on that list? He already hit me. But mm -hmm. point being is this is where things have escalated to. And you're right. The LAPD isn't going to do a damn thing about it. I've also had Internal Affairs send me a letter. Right. So I read this letter and I think to myself, this is just a serious cover my ass operation. You guys aren't actually going to do anything to change this stuff. 
I can't believe I'm saying this all publicly, but I'm really riled up. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, Frank Stoltz. I'm kind of also, enough. Frank Stoltz. They attacked Frank Stoltz. It was horrible. Yeah, Frank Stoltz has been a report. He's an older man. Um, he's been a reporter for KPCC, which is mm. one of the public radio stations. He was so shocked. He wrote a whole article saying, I've been covering protests for 30 years, including the Occupy protests. Um, and nobody has ever physically assaulted me. And what wow. I want to ask Tina, because I asked you this privately over direct message, is what do you make of Matt Taibbi, whose takes I agree with most of the time, going after Antifa? He actually I had a whole thought sub that was stack. strange. He yeah, had I a sub it. stack the other day that was just retweeted. I was on Joe Rogan's page because we're going to be talking about him maybe. Um, which Joe Rogan repeated in which it was all about Antifa and how they attacked the um, reporter for news to share um, in Portland. Um, and, and my experience with Antifa, now I've only covered them, you know, four or five times, but every uh, counter protest from Occupy inauguration to the day, you know, which, which was, and I was there in the skirmish line between Antifa and the cops. I went off the permitted march just to cover this. Um, and I talked to some of these people afterwards. Also, there was the big rally in Laguna Beach um, against the immigrants. There were 50 people protesting, immigrants are taking our jobs, and 2,500 people came out to counter protest them. I talked to Antifa people there. There was something similar in Santa Monica. And these people have all seemed to me to be very quiet, unassuming, not at all violent, not at all burly. They kind of look like skinny college kids to me. Yeah. They're just, you know, <laughs> wearing black. They, they were very well-spoken. I mean, some of them could have been DSA members, you know. Oh, 100%. Much, you know, how much theory they knew. And quite frankly, I've always been grateful for Antifa because they're the only ones out there fighting these fascists. You know, there's a group mm -hmm. called Refuse Fascism, which was started by Revcom, the Revolutionary Communist Party, Bob Avakian's group. And I used to kind of disdain them, thinking they were all cultists, because every time there was a protest, including Occupy, they would show up hand handing out their newspaper, and they all, you know, revere this Bob Avakian. But I swear to you, I mean, I lived just north of Beverly Hills during the whole Trump administration. Every time he was there having a fundraiser, I could not get the leftist groups to come out. The only people that consistently protested Trump and saw the danger of him and his administration were, were Antifa. No, not oh, even really? Antifa. Were refused fascism. And when oh, I would reach well. out to these, a lot of those guys are also members of Antifa, though I believe. Well, no, but they aren't. They were all refused, and because I had them on my show, and people would say, "Oh, we don't want to work with them." I mean, to this day. Uh, they're trying to organize Occupy 10 year anniversary party. And I spoke to one of the organizers and he said, oh, Lauren, feel free to call anybody. We'll work with anybody, but not refuse fascism. And I just think that kind of sectarianism or whatever you want to call it on the left is ridiculous when we're facing this fascist threat. Yeah. And, and to kind of go back to the. Um, can I just the, can I just yeah, say go one ahead. thing? Because I've been covering Black Lives Matter protests for a long time. I got five years of covering Trump protests <laughs> and that treachery. Uh, you know, I really respect Matt Taibbi. It's not just him who's now taking this angle on Antifa. Uh, I didn't see these folks commenting when a uh, anti-vaxxer attacked Tina and I know. tried to mm. pull her mask, tried to pull her mask down. Right. I have not seen them comment on the many. Maybe they just haven't seen it. I don't know. Yeah, I, haven't, no, I, seen it. He's I haven't seen them comment on the I mean, there's a whole lot more attacks coming from either MAGA, QAnon, yeah. uh, and now anti-vaxxers. Um, there's all, and it doesn't make it okay if, if an Antifa, Antifa person no, is violent, no. but it's really more narrative what's being pushed than Yeah, I don't like reality. the framing. Um, yeah. So yeah, let me, let me comment on that. I don't like the framing of that. I think if you're, if you're sticking to a principle, which is what I'm going to do right here, I'm going to say you should not attack press people, period, end of story. That is the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. The problem I have with Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi at this point is that they're framing it from the right wing, and I don't know why they're mm -hmm. doing that. And I'm also kind of irritated that neither of them have been present at these things, and instead of reaching out and having a conversation with folks that were, maybe that should have happened, right? Um, you that mean didn't happen. You mean, you mean journalism? 
Yeah. You know, and I know that that What's didn't that? happen. It might. I, well, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of irritated by this, especially from Glenn yeah. Greenwald. He knows better. And he was, you know, making all of these posts about what happened at We Spa last month. And he was really, really hyper focused on this one. And I'm going to call it inconsequential thing that happened. There was this anti-trans uh, Karen, so to speak, that showed up and was spewing a lot of anti-trans rhetoric and saying very hateful things. Um, so um, some folks in Black Block chased her away from We Spa because they, you know, they didn't want her coming up to the trans folks that were there protesting. So they were sort of acting like security, I guess you could say. Meanwhile, OK, so you're going to get hyper focused on that, right? Meanwhile, somebody was stabbed. I filmed it. He was a, a trans activist was stabbed. LAPD was there, too. Um, nobody talks about it. Another press uh, person, Rocky Romano was hit on the back of the head with a lead pipe intentionally a guy came up behind him hit him back on the head with this like wooden lead pipe thing ran away got into a vehicle that was being driven by a gubernatorial candidate by the way that's another story Jeez. kid you not oh this woman's running for governor right now and then they were circling around the streets while uh he was in the car and he's talking about how great it felt to crack this press guy on the back of the head with the lead pipe so again no mention of any of these things which as far as i'm concerned are far more important to the story than anything else then washington post picks up a story on this and they don't mention either of these things either no mention of the stabbing no mention of the press member attack with the lead pipe. Oh, and let me also say Tony Moon was there, the guy that attacked me. Tony Moon was there, was there, and he hit a, a woman and a trans visual, trans person, two people on the head with that hydro flask. I have video of both of it. Uh, there was another guy that had uh, like uh, giant rosary beads, because I don't know how else you describe these things, that he had wrapped around his hands and he was using them as a weapon. So he was hitting people and screaming, you're an abomination, you're going to hell, you're an abomination. So these were all very hateful individuals doing very hateful, violent things. But yes, yes, let's talk about the Karen that got chased out by Black Bloc, because that's what's important. So that's all again, I heard about. <laughs> okay, so you see my point? My point is, yeah. is this was an inconsequential thing, but because guys like Glenn, who didn't bother to find out the entire story about what had happened that day, decided to put that on blast, that's what people think was the problem. And I'm like, yeah, not even close. Not even close. And then the yeah. cops showed up to the stabbing victim's bedside in the hospital, and instead of treating him like a victim, tried to accuse him of inciting a riot because that's what the cops do. If the victim isn't of the right, all of a sudden it still has to be their fault. It's insane that this is what's happening.